Good morning, or, well, good afternoon. This is Wayne Bilal with another Smart Profit Maximizing Moment. My apologies, I've been doing these for over almost two years in the morning, and we've started doing them in the afternoon because it was getting harder to do it in the morning because I keep getting interrupted. Um, to, the purpose of these Smart Profit Maximizing Moments is usually I'm count, talking about how to increase profits. A little bit of switch today. We're going to get into some of the changes on the PPP loan changes that you really need to know about before you um, start asking for forgiveness, all right? So, a couple things going on. First of all, make sure you're part of my group. If you're not, you need to join it. You know, you've been getting all kinds of stuff uh, telling you to join, so make sure you get into the group so you get contacts more. I have a, a team member now who's helping me. Um, so, Sydney is her name, so feel free if you have a question to go through her also. Um, I'm going to spend some time today talking about the PPP loans, like I said. It, it, the forgiveness package, and I, and I did a course on this, and, and so much has changed since then. Let me give you an idea. I took a course on the, the rules and the regulations on the PPP. The same people, the PPP forgiveness and the whole program. The same people put a course together three weeks later. At the first hour and a half was on the things that had changed in the prior three weeks. <laughs> this thing, I've never dealt with anything like this that is a moving target, all right? A um, couple things to start with, and, and I'm going to cover a lot of information, and it's kind of going to be all jumbled, and we're going to jump from topic to topic and go fast. So, you know, I post this again. Um, it's also in my blog, uh, wjb-cpa.com. You go look in the top left-hand corner, you'll see a tab for that. Plus, I'm pretty sure it's going to be posted here. Um, there's a lot of stuff here, so you're probably going to want to watch it again. But more importantly, if you're, if you're doing it yourself, pay attention to these things. And I'll be honest with you, if you got any kind of large loan or anything big, it's kind of dangerous for you to do it yourself because of all the changes. And even if you hired somebody else to do it, you want to make sure that you look at it. Look, one of the things that in all the courses and all the literature I've been looking at is the SBA will be reviewing all loans to determine if they should have even received the loan in the first place. So it's probably not a bad idea, I'm going to be doing it for all my clients, to put in a disclosure that's attached to the paperwork I spend, uh, send in talking about what the mindset of the owner was back in March or April. Uh, and I'll give you an example. I got a contractor at that time. We weren't sure what was going on in the world. You know, it just shut down. We weren't sure where we were going, what was happening. So we literally, at that point, um, had a contract drop. Two others canceled. Well, one canceled, two others postponed. We didn't know what was happening, so we put in the application. Well, now it's easy to look back with hindsight when they come in a year or two from now and say, well, you shouldn't have gotten it because look how good you did. Well, we didn't know that back then. And, and there's a big difference. I see a lot more cases of bank fraud being prosecuted than I see IRS issues being prosecuted. So it's always smart to be defensive. And I would definitely put it in, uh, what counts is what was in your mind back in March and April when you applied for it. So make sure you document it, you know, while you still remember. Yeah, at the time I had, you know, the courts were closed if you're a lawyer. I don't know how I'm supposed to do work or a property tax consultant. I have one of those who, you know, still can't get into courts, all right? I had clients that were shutting down, whatever the case may be, all right? I'm going to go through these. They're not going to necessarily feel like they're all there, but they're things that have changed since last time. So, and clarifications. You know, the problem with pushing through a law like this is that you know, they can't think of everything. So, for example, rent is one of the things you can for get forgiven. But if you happen to sublease a part of it, you have to reduce that part, all right? And what's really kind of weird about it, it's not based on the rent. It's based on the fair market value of the part that they're using. It really gets crazy, all right? Mortgage interest that's paid to a related party is not forgivable. We didn't know that back at the beginning. So if I was renting a uh, if I was... Um, say I bought it from my dad or from another shareholder, uh, the shareholder, the business is buying it, whatever. If it's a related party, the interest is not deductible. Rent paid, uh, rent paid to a related party is limited to the mortgage interest owed in the lease agreement, and all of those must be signed before February 15th of 2020. You can't do one after. Be careful, I've heard that. Payroll earned in the covered period which is the period of the eight weeks or the 24 weeks, we'll talk about that in a minute, 
uh, includes starting at the beginning and uh, beginning of covered period if totally earned before the pay period but paid during the covered period so for example if I got my loan May 1st and my I have a paycheck on May 2nd that covers payroll that was all for April according to this I can put it in there all right however that's only if it's weekly or bi-weekly if you're bi-monthly or monthly it has to be prorated I'll be honest with you it's kind of crazy to get into this kind of stupid stuff uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, how you can avoid all these weird things like rent and everything. Give me a second, I'm having trouble turning the page. I took a ton of notes when I sat through this video. Retirement benefits is a big problem. If you put retirement benefits in there, remember it's only for the employer contribution paid or incurred by the borrower during the covered period. That seems to be up in the air, all right? It's not for payments from the prior year, and it's not for employee payments, all right? So, again, what... How are we going to put in there? I, I'd play it a little conservative and, and maybe elect the 24 week, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Now, one of the things that people didn't understand, well, I spent it all for payroll, so it's all going to be 100% excluded. No, not necessarily. There's two things that will cause your, your, your exclusion, your forgiveness to be reduced, okay? One is if you had a drop in pay. I haven't seen that very much where... You know, hey, well, it's been in the news recently, Southwest Airlines saying, hey, you know, we need you to take a, a drop in pay or else we're going to have to furlough, which lay off some people, all right? If you did that, then you have some problems, all right? Uh, second thing you need to worry about is a drop in head count. In other words, you had 10 employees, now you have eight. Now, the way that would work, in my example, is that only 80% of the loan would be forgiven unless you had some of the exceptions, which we're going to talk about, all right? Um, Best practice, now let's talk about a sole proprietor and then I'll come back to that. Best practices for a sole proprietor. If you're a sole proprietor, you got some amount based on what your income was. Now, how do you ever do payroll? I mean, you, you, you know, you're a sole proprietor, so you don't have payroll. So all the discussion I've read and all the courses I've went to basically say the best thing is to pay yourself. You know, like So, for example, you could get up to either $15,385 if you took the eight week period or 20, or elect the 24 week period and get 46,154, not, can't be more than your, that's if you made 100,000 or more, um, which you shouldn't, if you made 100,000 or more in your Schedule C, you shouldn't be a Schedule C. But whatever that amount is, okay, you don't have a paycheck, what do you turn in? What they're saying is you need to turn in that you paid yourself in draws. Well. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, I paid the mortgage, I paid my own personal utilities, I took, I paid the dentist, I don't want to do that. So best practice would be for you to actually write yourself a check up to the amount of the loan during your covered period. Again, this gets tricky, so make sure you actually get there. Another question that came up was, what about bonuses? Can I bonus enough to get there? This is, I'd be on, remember, you're going to be audited by the SBA. The bank first has to approve it, and then the SBA still has the ability to audit it. And don't forget the auditors, the SBA has a team of lawyers looking at these things, looking for ways that somebody abused it. And if you went in there and did a bonus, I think you're asking for trouble. Simple as that. Unless it's bonuses that you normally have done in the course of business, all right? Um, now you, can I do hazard pay? Yeah, probably. So, for example, if I was, and I had somebody who was doing that, that, you know, a grocery store, and they were asking them to come in, and since they were dealing with people, they paid them a hazard pay. I think that's totally uh, legitimate, and everything I read said it was. Um, another kind of tr jumping around utilities and rent, um, if it was incurred during the covered period, let's say I ended it in July 31st, but I didn't pay the bill, I paid July's bill in August, I can put that on there. But I'm gonna show you a way at, at the end of this to ignore that entirely. Now let's talk about, is this you know, question I get all the time, how does this affect my taxes? Well, here's the thing, the, the CARES Act said that the, the PPP loan was non-deductible, I mean, sorry, it was not income, all right? IRS Notice 2020-32 said any fund expenses funded by, by forgiven PPP loans is not deductible. You know, for all practical purposes, they made it income, didn't they? If I pay, if I get a $100,000 loan and I paid it all for payroll, it's forgiven. They're saying, okay, I'm not making that income, but I can't deduct $100,000 worth of payroll. All right, what's going on? Well, there's a lot of literature that doesn't agree with this in the tax world. And there's a ton of people saying, hey, um, 
don't agree. You know, so you got some choice. And truthfully, quite a few senators and, and, and congressmen from both sides of the aisle are saying this is not what we intended. We didn't intend to give you $100,000 and then take $25,000 back. That wasn't what we intended. But we're in silly season. We're just a few weeks out from an election, so ain't nothing getting done right now, as you can tell. All right. Now, if they may sneak it in. Um, that that comes down to, can, what should you do? I have a feeling they'll fix it. Okay. I'll give you an example. In the 2018 Tax Act, they made a mistake in regards to depreciation rules for leasehold improvements that they fixed this year. Now, I'm going to have to go back for a half a dozen clients or so and, and amend their 18 and 19 returns. Um, not cool. But there's so many PPP loans. I hope the heck they don't do that. So what I'm going to be recommending to my clients, that was tough, recommending to my clients is even if they don't, if they don't get it for, fixed before they do their return, that I, the, their corporate return is due March 15th, or their personal return is due April 15th. I would extend it and give extra time. And, you know, we'll see. Um, let's move on from that. Let's talk about uh, drop in pay. Um, if you had a drop in pay or a uh, in the testing period, the, if the pay rate's the same but the overtime was situational, I think you can make an argument that that you don't have a drop in pay. Let's say before the time before you got the loan, you were doing something that required a ton of overtime. Let's say you're a contractor and you had a big job. After you didn't have that job, I would not. Ar I would argue that their base pay stayed the same. It was their average, their overtime that was different. Same thing with commissions. If you had somebody on commissions and they were making a lot of commissions, and now they're not getting any. I would argue that's definitely a situational thing because nobody's buying after COVID hit, all right? Now, a drop in head count's very, very tricky. The first thing you have to do is compare the head count that you had in three different time periods, two really, uh, against the head count during the time you had the PPP, your covered period, all right? So the first time period is how many people you had between January 1st, 2020 to February 29th, 2020, or you can use the February 15th, 19th to June 30th, 19th time period, whichever is best. If you're a seasonal employer, this gets a little trickier because you can pick any 12-week period between May 1st, 19th and 9 15 19. Then what you have to do is you have to compute your FTE weekly, full-time equivalent hours. It's basically taking anybody divided by 40 to see how many people who came up with. And, you know, for example, if I have... Um, eight people that worked 40 hours, I got eight people, and if I have two more that work 20 hours each, that becomes nine. Man, get with an accountant. And there's two different ways to calculate it. Um, you're probably going to use a simplified. I'm not even going to get into that. But what happens if you have a drop in head count? Well, if you have a drop in head count, you're going to have to have part of it not forgiven. Well, there's exceptions, and there's really two types of exceptions. There's safe harbors, and then there's reduction exceptions, which are position by position. So the first one is the magic, the magic moment, which is basically I get my head count back to where it was supposed to, where it was back in those two time periods I talked about, either early this year or sometime last year, and I get it back to that point sometime before the end of the year. If I do that, there's no penalty, all right? Um, or if I can argue that the drop happened and occurred because of COVID. Now that can be kind of interesting. Can, you know, uh, I have an attorney who was considered an essential business, but the courts are closed. So they didn't really need people, they had a drop. I would argue, even though they're considered an essential business, that they can argue that they were affected by COVID and you're gonna to have to turn in the paperwork on this. Documentation is gonna be everything. Make sure you turn in the paperwork that talks about how much, you know, show that the courts were closed and how much of your business was there. This is gonna be tricky. Now, if you have a drop in head count, there's five exceptions that go by employee by employee. Okay, if you don't qualify for any of the first two that you were, that you got back to where you were supposed to be or you were affected by COVID, then there's five different things that can come in there. One, employee won't restore the hours themselves. They refuse to work. You're gonna to need to document this. What are you, you're gonna to need to turn something in. The employer was fired for cause. Again, you should have not documented that, but we're gonna to have to turn that in also. They have voluntarily resigned, all right? 
requested a redu the employee re requested a reduction in hours. Maybe they got to take care of somebody that had COVID. You can't get them to come back to work, and you can't get somebody good. I don't know how you're going to send in documentation for that, but we'll have to come up with something. You, or you can't return to the same level of compliance due to an order from the government, from any governmental agency related to sanitation, social distancing, or other worker or customer safety requirement. Again, the key is documentation. That last one, probably a restaurant. I mean, in El Paso, the bar in Texas, the bars are finally allowed to open. I mean, it seems like I would fall truthfully under the exception because of COVID, but uh, case by case. Um, I don't want to get into too much more because I'm throwing a bunch at you. I'm going to recommend, let's go back to the 24 versus 8 week period. The, there, was a tech, there was another bill passed, I want to say around June 30th, I should know this, I forgot to look it up before I came on, that allowed us to use a 24 week period instead of an 8 week period. Now what that allows me to do, and I'm probably going to elect the 24 week period for just about everybody, because what that allows me to do is use payroll Let's say I got a hundred thousand dollar loan, and here's where the problem was: I got to get the loan based on two and a half months worth of payroll, but I had to spend it in eight weeks. So the only way to actually use it in eight weeks, because do the math, eight weeks is not two and a half months, is I was going to have to do utilities, I was going to have to do rent, I was going to have to do retirement plans, and that requires me to send in a bunch of paperwork. Like I need to send in the rent agreement, I got to send in the mortgage payment and the original note, I got to send in utility bills. Well, elect twenty four weeks and forget all that. And just wait, you know, it's probably going to take you 11 or 12 weeks to use up all the, you know, maybe 12, 13 weeks, whatever. Go as long as it takes for you to use up the funds for payroll only, all right? And that way I don't have to mess with all, this, all the, the weird stuff that still needs to be clarified about rentals and retirement plans and mortgage interest and utilities, okay? I just spend it on payroll, which is what it was intended to be. I think that's the smart move and it's probably what I'm going to do the most. I'm going to end with a rumor <laughs> that I've heard a bunch of because the media got their hands on this and then of course business owners caught it. The rumor was that if, you're, if your loan is under $150,000 it's automatically forgiven. That is not true. <laughs> Simple as that. It has not been passed. It is not true. Okay, So Right now, the way the law is, you still have to send in the forgiveness. And even if it, they do pass this 150 or less, and to be honest about it, I got one of the bankers that works with the SBA. The SBA is trying to see if they have the authority through, an, excuse me, through an executive order or not, to take anything under 50,000 and change it to just a simple format, where you're just basically certifying that I spent the money on payroll and I did that. So if they change to that, which is more likely than they're just going to forgive anything under 150000 they're going to change to something that says, I got the loan because I needed it, I spent the money on payroll, I have all the documentation if I need to. That's the kind of thing that it looks like they're heading towards if they head to anything. You're still going to have to put all this paperwork together, and you're still going to want to document if you have a redu reduction in headcount for some reason. At the end of the day, I went through this kind of fast, and I didn't even touch on the hard stuff. All right, I think you're going to want to get help if you did, if you unless you just stick. I, I think you don't need as much help if you elect to go to 24 weeks, um, you know, and, and and use that. I mean, go to the SBA, go call your bank, get the form, try to use the easy form if at all possible, so that you're spending as as little. They, you know, if you qualify, it's a lot easier to use. Um, I think I covered everything I was going to cover. Um, I know I, I talked a little bit longer than I wanted to. This is closer to 20 minutes. I usually try to stop at 10 to 10 or 12 minutes. But there's a lot here. Okay, I'm going to close on this. Get help. Make sure you don't open yourself up to being accused of, of fraud or anything by the SBA. Even if, it do you, if you do it yourself, it's probably worth having somebody review it. Um, that you did your due diligence, that you didn't try to cheat, that you tried to do it right. So it never hurts to have an attorney or a CPA or somebody, you know, buy a couple hours at a time and have them review what you're doing. All right. And use the 24 week, try to stick to payroll only. Those would be the things I would close with. Hey, until next time, we'll get back to talking about how to increase your profits. But this was kind of an important one because people are starting to get the PPPs. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And let's make this our most profitable year ever. Thanks.